I've been really excited about sharing this inverter with you guys. And the main reason is the way that it can handle solar panels. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So the first piece of this setup is really the storage and I chose an enclosed cabinet here so that I could just open these doors up and expose the five kilowatt hours worth of batteries I've got in here. These were only 300 bucks a pop, so like 1200 bucks for five kilowatt hours of lithium iron phosphate, pretty slick. Anyway, so outside of that, we've got the inverter that you saw in the intro, but let me walk around here and show you the breaker panel. So here on one side of the unit, we've got a breaker panel, which the inverter is wired up to. This inverter supplies 120 volts. I did go ahead and do a dual pole breaker for the input here. This is the 50 amps coming from the inverter. Just in case I ever upgraded and actually did have 240 volts coming in. And then what we've got here is two different 20 amp breakers for the two GFCI outlets here. So you can actually pull you know, like two kilowatts off of this, two kilowatts off of this, a lot of power can come through there. And then of course here we've got our GFCI 50 amp breaker for our dryer outlet. No, I'm just kidding. You wouldn't really run a dryer off of this, but this is like what you would have for an RV hookup, right? So if you ever wanted to wire this up to your main panel in your house, you could get one of those big plugs that plugs in here and it could handle 50 amps, 120 volts over to your main breaker panel. The reason that I went with GFCI everywhere is that with this being a rolling cabinet that's up on wheels, the grounding and the neutral really can't be bonded in here if you're gonna be plugging this into the main panel, whatnot. So I did GFCIs here and a GFCI breaker here just to protect things. And you can look up to see how GFCI protects things, but basically it's looking at the line and the neutral. And if there's ever any difference in current between those two, then it just kills everything. Just a good safety feature to have. Now over to our solar panels. These are just some used panels that we've got, you know, stacked in a pallet over here. These are 230 watts a piece from Astronergy. Astronergy? That's kind of a weird name. I always thought it was Astro Energy, but they don't have enough E's in it to be Astro Energy. Anyway, I digress. 230 watts a piece. They're 37 volt open circuit each. Those are all wired back here. And you'll see that I just have a single pair of wires coming in at 12 gauge which is kind of unheard of when you're talking about, you know, 1.8 kilowatts worth of solar coming into an off-grid inverter. And I ran them through a breaker here just so I can flip them off and on, no big deal. And then straight up into the inverter from below. We do have a battery disconnect switch here just for convenience, don't necessarily need it. And the BMS on the batteries is set to 100 amps. If I ever added a second set of batteries, then I'd really wanna fuse here between the inverter and the switch, or between the switch and the batteries, just to keep things safe um, for the wiring here. But this is also two gauge wiring, which can handle a pretty heavy load. So the special thing that I was talking about though, was really this solar wiring. It's only 12 gauge because we're running high voltage, all of these panels in series. So I'm up in the 300 volt range for this off-grid inverter. So at this point you're like, hey Bean, yeah, there's wires running into the inverter, what's the big deal? The big deal is that it's 12 gauge wire and that should be all you need. The reason for that is the high voltage input, that 500 volts. So in the setup I've got out there, I've got eight panels in series, which gets me a fairly high voltage up in the 300s or so. And I could go up to 13 panels in series, get myself three kilowatts just using one string of panels and that's it. Now, one limitation to this inverter is though it's got the high voltage input, it's limited to 16 amps input. Um, so if you look at these 230 watt panels that I've been messing with, they are just over eight amps short circuit. So you couldn't do two strings of these 230 watt panels into this inverter, which means once you've maxed out the voltage limit, that's it. So you could do three kilowatts worth of the 230s. But what these inverters were built for was newer panels. Like, let me show you here. These behemoths are sun power cells, 128 in series. That is 85.6 volts for every panel, but you get 435 watts off of one of these puppies. Now that becomes a problem when you're talking about one of these older grow watts. Ooh, let me spin around here. Like these down here where they can only go up to 145 volts because you can only have one panel before you just start stacking in parallel. With the sun powers at 85.6 volts, you can do five of these in series 
and still be under the 500 volt limit of the inverter, do a second string since there are six amps, get yourself 12 amps coming in, and now you've got 4.35 kilowatts coming into the inverter. Now, one thing that I did notice when I was setting all this up is, is I'm doing this as a portable on wheels unit. And, the, and I think that this was accentuated, this problem that I'm about to explain, because there's such a high voltage DC coming into the inverter, um, with the, the lower power inverters, it, it doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal. With this one, I noticed that there was some potential, some electricity potential between the casing of the inverter and the cement as I was sitting out here. And that's because your panels are supposed to be grounded, which they're sitting on the ground, so like they're sort of grounded right now, right? The inverter's supposed to be grounded. My inverter was not grounded at all. It was completely floating. So I was getting like 80 or 90 volts AC at very small current between the inverter casing and the cement. The way I fixed that was, and this is reasonable to do for a house backup system, is I connected a cord onto the input of this inverter charger. So I have a ground wire now because I'm connected to the, the grid or your panel. And the grid doesn't have to be up for that to work. The ground wire is always connected. You're always grounded whether the grid is turned on or not. So if you had this wire to your house, so off of that 50 amp outlet, then it would be grounded because you'd have the ground running from there to the house. Or if you don't have that, you could always plug the source into your house where it can pull power from the house if you want, if you've got the settings set that way. Um, and it would ground it that way. And doing that reduces the potential and it's no big deal. But I wanted to mention that if you ever set up one of these, and that probably applies for a lot of other units like this, I think this one's just accentuated because of the high voltage DC. Running 300 volts into here, I ended up with some, some AC voltage be between the casing and the, and the cement um, that was just a little bit scary. It didn't hurt me. Um, but you could tell that it was like that 60 hertz uh, buzz when you touch the case. So now comes the question of, is it better to build this yourself or to buy something that already does this? Renogy is coming out with, they're doing pre-sales on a $3,800 unit that has the same capacity of battery, has a 3,500 watt inverter instead of 5,000 watts, and it has 145 volt worth of solar input instead of 500 volts. So comparable, this one's a little bit better of an inverter um, for 3,800 bucks. This can be done with the panels, because theirs doesn't include panels, for three grand. Um, I'll, I'll throw the links down below of the stuff that I use to put this together, but literally about $3,000 and you could have almost 2,000 watts worth of solar, 5,000 watt inverter, five kilowatt hour battery, all on a rolling cabinet, ready to go. It's pretty cool.